Yes, John. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Right, we're getting there. Yes, well done. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. I'm just going back. Right, we're in business. Uh, sorry about that, but we're new to the game. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, Liz and I work as a team as I'm visually impaired. Uh, Liz spots the wildlife and with considerable patience tries to point it out so that I can take photographs. Uh, we are enthusiastic amateur naturalists with a range of interests and we have been members of the Devon Wildlife Trust for 31 years and have been volunteering at Bystock Pools since 2004. We started by helping with the reserves management um, which we continue to this day with a break for the uh, dreaded disease. Um, and for um, 12 years, we undertook the breeding bird survey. Over the years, we've recorded anything that we see and have built up a good list of species. Now, one of the first questions I'm asked at most of the uh, meetings I've been to is what sort of camera do I use? Well, this is my camera which is a Canon SX60 bridge camera. Um, for some odd reason, it's got lines all over the screen. Um, anyway, um, we've called the show uh, An Impression of Bystock. Does anyone know how to get rid of the lines on the screen? I've got a whole load of blue lines. Is it a pen or something? No answer, no, right. Yeah, um, Roger, Sarah here. I think someone might be editing by using the pencil. Um, it might be just as well to turn that off. I don't know if Mary can do that. No? Well, in that case, if, if you don't know how to do it, we'll have to live with them. I'm not, I really don't know what that is. Um, obviously some sort of um, mouse generated uh, Pattern. Anyway, let's carry on then and we'll ignore that. Um, in 1086, Bystock was in the manner of Colleton Raleigh. And sometime later, it was granted to Polslow Abbey, um, Pol Polslow Priory, which it held and, um, dis till the dissolution. It then was sold into private hands and basically has remained so ever since. Uh, a mansion was built on the land, and this first house built, burnt down in 1906 and was rebuilt. The replacement house still exists. The owners of the house didn't want to pay any water company, uh, pay the water company for a supply, so they had their own reservoir built. And this is now the um, pond that, as we know, at the south entrance to Bystock Reserve. Bystock Pools Reserve uh, uh, is outlined in yellow here on this uh, Google map. And it's situated just inside the Exmouth border, about three miles northeast of the town centre. In 1928, the Exmouth and District Water Company acquired Bystock Reservoir and the surrounding land. This subsequently passed to the southwest water and thence to Southwest Lakes Trust, which is their charitable. The site is 27 hectares or 57 acres. It's part of the East Devon Pebble Bed Heath SSSI and the East Devon area of outstanding natural beauty and a whole host of other designations I can never remember. Let's have a look at the geography. Um, First of all, the reservoir. Reservoir is at the south end of the reserve and uh, is the reason for uh, Bystock's existence as a water supply for the house. It actually supplied two houses. The other one was Marley, but Marley's disappeared long ago. Millwood. Millwood is mixed woodland and it runs down the side of the road, uh, the south end of the reserve. Pinewood, 
which is on the east side of the reserve, which is predominantly Scots pine with some maritime pine amongst it, and a few bits and pieces of um, native holly and, and silver birch. North and South Heath, these are two small areas of dry heathland, uh, one at the top, one at the bottom of, uh, um, of the centre part of the reserve. And the meadow, the meadow is um, a semi-improved neutral grassland and is uh, all the better for that. The copse, the copse is a piece of woodland that strangely is predominantly broad-leaved oak, but the oak is all turkey oak. Uh, the reserve itself has very few mature native trees, native to Devon that is. Um, as I say, we don't have any English oak, mature English oak trees on the reserve. Uh, the other trees here, we had the odd sycamore, which we've now got rid of most of, a few seedlings left, silver birch, hawthorn, holly, Brockwood is on the west side of the reserve and is predominantly bleach. And you've probably gathered by now that as we have a beech wood, an oak wood and a pine wood, that these are all uh, non-natural woodland piloted by the people who own their house. The valley, which is um, a piece of mixed heathland, the centre part of the valley is wet heathland and each side is dry heathland. Right, let's get into the details. The nitty gritty blue lines are annoying me, you know. Um, the reservoir is very good for looking at some plants, fortified plants. We have a good crop of uh, yellow flag and marsh marigold, and as you probably noticed, um, white water, um, water lily. Barstock Reserve is noted as the tenth, one of the 10 best reserves for dragonflies and damselflies in the whole country. It's basically what we're known for, as it were. So here we have a locally important species, um, the hairy uh, dragonfly, which flies fairly early in the year, and the emperor. Um, the emperor is arguably our biggest dragonfly, but as you'll see later, there's a little bit of a discussion over that. If you're very lucky earlier in the year, um, you could find one of these wandering along the handrails by the side of the reservoir. This is the larva of a, a downy emerald, which has come out to emerge into the adult. And here is a uh, newly emerged downy emerald dragonfly um, this stage, while it's pumping its wings up and gaining its full colour, is known as tenor. Here's an adult, full adult here, uh, with its lovely green eyes. And if you look very carefully at the picture, you probably can see the reason for its downy name. That is the hairs on the um, thorax there. A bit more of the uh, reservoir here. And here we have a southern damselfly, a southern, <laughs> southern, southern hawker, thank you, I've got my prompt next to me, um, southern hawker and later in the year, um, although they fly uh, simultaneously, um, this is the migrant hawker. Uh, if you want to tell the difference easily, although you, it's not easy to see from the picture, but the two end segments of the southern blue all the way around like a ring of blue and these believe it or not stand out like little beacons when they fly past and they do fly past quite easily if you um if you stand on the uh ball fork or the rails by the right of the reservoir um these both these species will come quite close in if you're really lucky and you're hanging around the reservoir on one of its more quiet days you might be lucky enough to find kingfisher. We have a fairly regular, um, I should say frequent visits from kingfisher and one year we had a pair for some while but we never did manage to prove breeding. 
fungus. Um, we get a, a lot of fungus. This is, these are the pores of the velvet bolete or velvet brittle gill. And I just thought there's such a fascinating pattern it would be worth looking at. The top side of this um, fairly scarce um, mushroom uh, fungus uh, is a pure brown, vile, uninteresting um, thing. <laughs> um, bog beacon is another one. Uh, bog beacon is um, found in the wetter areas around little streams leading from or to the reserve. And amethyst is either pretty little purple colored fungus. Right, moving down from the reservoir, we come to Mill Wood. Mill Wood is a piece of mixed woodland and is pretty good for spring flowers. First of all, we've got the yellow archangel, one of our mints, got quite a few of the mint family in, um, uh, on the reserve. And lesser celandine, it's fairly common, uh, especially along the road. And sanical, uh, sanical is a really pretty little flower. It, it can easily be ignored, but I love it. Um, and that again grows along the roadside, quite easy to see. Right, this building here is why we called it Mill Wood. Um, <laughs> it's erroneous. It's not a mill. We've had a, a meeting with the Exmouth Local History Group and we did a sort of time team on it. And it's full of anomalies. There's no evidence of any mill. It doesn't appear on the tithe map, which it probably would have done. Uh, the two chimney uh, fireplaces that you can see uh, just to the left of center of the picture, have chimneys that go right to the top of the wall and they're very clean. There's no sign of soot or anything in them. And there's no return wall on this end of the building. So there never was a room around those um, fireplaces. So the consensus now is that it was a folly built by the family for their own amusement. However, in 2013, a tree fell on it and it's now smashed. Um, the names of the areas uh, of the reserve um, were concocted by Liz and myself because when we were walking around, especially when we were showing people, it was very difficult for us to remember the designations given to it by the trust. Um, they were designated as compartment seven, compartment 11, compartment 13. So we chose the first things that came into our mind and um, Consequently, uh, we made mistakes. Uh, the, this isn't a mill, we call it mill wood, but there you go. Good place for black caps. Um, I have quite a few black caps on the, on the side. And uh, chiff chaffs. Again, uh, a fairly common species. We've had up to 10 pairs on good years. This is another view of uh, Millwood and Millwood of course again being slightly damp will have quite a few ferns. Here's one example as it brought back the fern and this one is what I like to call fishtail fern uh, which is a, um, a, a common name for it. It's actually hard fern and called fishtail fern as you can see that central fruiting body looks rather like the um, ribs of a fish bone. Right, if we go through the wood and come out into north and then on to south heath, these are dry heathlands and dry heathlands have heather and gorse on. Here's a view across the valley from south, uh, from north heath. Uh, and the heathers are good indication of heath. And we have three species. This one's bell heather, and we have cross leaf teeth in the damper areas, and later on in the year, common ling. The, the, I like this one. The, the scientific name is Coluna. It comes from the Latin to clean, and it's thought to get its name from the fact that it used to be uh, cut and used for besoms to uh, sweep 
your house rooms. Another view from the valley looking towards some of the drier areas. Um, as you can see a path in the distance, we have a number of uh, fairly bare paths and each side of the paths are, have gorse and are good places to find um, the uh, <laughs> green hair streak, my prompt here. Uh, the green hair streak, uh, beautiful butterfly. Um, and if you're uh, fairly lucky, one of these. Now, uh, many of you will immediately know what that is. Um, those of you who don't, um, it is in fact a um, grayling butterfly. Now, graylings always land with their wings closed. They lean at a slight angle so as not to gasp a shadow. But one day Liz and I were doing a survey and she noticed a fluttering on the ground and there was something there um, madly fluttering. So I put the camera onto auto shutter and pressed the button and waited. And I noticed that it was holding its wings open for longer than it was closing them for a short period. I managed to get this upper side, uh, which is a very unusual photograph. Um, when I got home and uh, developed them, as it were, put them on the computer, I noticed that they were, in fact, a mating pair. There's another one underneath this one. However, I was lucky enough to get the top side shot. I was really well pleased. Another view of the uh, um, North Heath with an open path, and this is the sort of place where you're very likely to see green tiger beetles. Uh, we have good populations, green tiger beetles, and they're so easy to see, and they're uh, yeah, that easy to photograph, they really shift. We have common carder bees. Moving on to the meadow, the semi-improved grassland. Uh, it's probably one of the best areas to see um, insects and flowers. It's about four acres in size. And here's some of our permanent 24 hour management team. Uh, we have four, uh, three uh, Exmoor ponies. They're purebred and they're totally wild. So they're never fed apart from their own efforts and they're um, put on the heath to help keep down the millennia grass in the wet valley. But they do eat other things as well, of course, and so help keep the, the place tidy. Um, we do have a management um, work party of people who you'll see later that do the If you're lucky enough to turn up in um, spring, on a nice warmish day, you might be lucky enough to see some of our migrant birds. On quite a few occasions, we have wheat ears passing through, and they spend a couple of days there, uh, adding their uh, rather bright um, beauty to the uh, to the meadow. And a couple of years ago, uh, maybe three years ago, we had ring oozle. Um, two ring oozles, one in one year and one the next year, both males and neither of them, uh, sorry, there were two different birds, they had different markings on. Really nice bird to see, especially as they're getting very, very scarce in Devon now. A little later on in the meadow, you'll find that it will turn from a grass green into a pretty good carpet of um, uh, Jamanda Speedwell, thank you, prompt. Jamanda <laughs> uh, Speedwell um, is one of about three Speedwells we have uh, on the reserve. We also have Heath and Ivy Leaved, uh, but this is the one that carpets the meadow. In the meadow, also, um, you're likely to see common milkwort, which is uh, medicinally used, used to be used for encouraging milk in mothers. Um, I like the fact that the scientific name for once ties in with the English name. Scientific name is polygla, polygala. Poly uh, is the Greek for much or many, and gala is the Greek for milk. 
uh, in June, we have really good crops of first foot trefoil, and it's a very good time to see our profusion of common spotted orchids. Uh, these orchids um, started off when we started managing the, um, the, the reserve, helping the management of the reserve. We were clearing um, scrub and um, the, uh, other odds and ends from the corner in the top right hand side of the meadow and found a few of these, maybe 20 at the most. And since then, with the various clearances we've had, there's probably more than 200, maybe 250 over the reserve now. Another view of the, uh, of the meadow. Good place to see large skipper and small skipper. And to add to the trio, we're very lucky to have dingy skipper. This is quite a scarce species around here. Um, when we first started um, helping on the reserve and counting, we used to get uh, two broods of these a year. They were never in high numbers. Um, and then slowly they reduced themselves to one brood. And then four years ago, we stopped recording them. But luckily our daughter and son-in-law last year uh, were doing a, a walk around and found three in the bottom left-hand side of the meadow uh, right hand side of the meadow as it were. Um, so we not actually lost them, they're just under recorded. So that was a real um, bonus. I was a little worried about them because the nearest populations that could possibly be feeder populations that I know of are Quants in Somerset, the Baldens and um, Branscombe Cliffs. So uh, if they had died out, I don't know where we would have got replacements. Another view of the meadow, uh, a little later on again, you can see the ragwort, which um, when we started covered the whole of the meadow, but a management team with um, Denmark Life Trust volunteers and a team from, uh, uh, from the RSPB went through what was basically a yellow field of ragwort and pulled the whole lot. And we've been pulling it ever since and it's kept down very well now. Other plants you'll find in the meadow, uh, this is uh, common vetch. And we have a very small population sometimes of this, which is pale flax. And we've got tons of this. This is um, shiny eye bright. Now I can be confident in calling it shiny eye bright. Many of you will know that eye brights are one of those aggregate species of which um, there are hundreds in the species and they're very difficult to tell apart. But um, a friend of mine sent a sample of this off to Kew Gardens and they came back with a definitive species, which was rather nice. It's nice to know these. Um, this is a picture of the meadow showing some of our um, prolific uh, And this is a good place to see small heath. And we do have both five and six spot burnets in the meadow. And the nice thing there is that this picture was laid on a plate for me where both are on the single plant, which is nice. And small coppers, uh, delightful species, had to speck touch of any walk. Moving on to um, some of the larger meadow species. This is the marble white. We have quite good populations of marble white um, and meadow brown. This meadow brown is on devil's bit scabious. Um, we love devil bit scabious. Uh, there was a story when we first moved down here in the copse where there is some, which we've been trying to expand uh, lately. Um, there was a talk of trying to uh, either encourage or retain, um, not retain, to, to uh, encourage uh, marsh fertility back because there was apparently historic records of it. I didn't think there was any possibility. Um, sorry, another, another picture showing the profusion of birds foot trefoil, but luckily 
it is a very good food plant for many of our butterflies. Here's a close up of the, uh, of the flower itself. Uh, it's a pea family, of course, a legume. And in the early days when we rediscovered um, this butterfly on the meadow, which is a silver studded blue, um, they were in the meadow, which is atypical for this area because in this area, they are a heathland species only and feed on heathers and gorse, whereas we were feeding ours on bird's foot trefoil. Uh, there was no gorse in the meadow, but we had a small population of these for several years. Um, we wanted to find an egg. We searched high and low for an egg. Unfortunately, we never did get it. Um, but Liz and I um, occasionally go on uh, forays with uh, the pebble bed clubs and um, other people from the RSPB and so on, looking for eggs in other places. And one of our friends found this egg on a piece of bracken, dead bracken, um, on different clumps. Um, they're minute and they're very hard to see. This picture of a mating pair showing the underside. If you're not sure why they're called silver study blues, this is a close up of the underwings. Um, and if you look around the dots on the periphery of the, the underwings, you, the black dots, you can see small turquoise spots in them. And that, those are the, uh, the dots that give it its name. Just because they fly sometimes at the same time, um, they overlap. Uh, this is a common blue, slightly larger than the silver studded blue. And in good specimens, not worn ones, the common blue has a narrow black border around the wing and the silver studded blue has a broad black border. So they are quite easily identified given a good look. I like to photograph them because that way, that way you can be absolutely certain. Right, and I showed this photograph. Um, the gap in the hedge at the back is where we just were, that's the meadow. And this area here, as you can see, is full of scrub. We've taken out most of the birch. And this is one of our work parties. And um, we were trying to clear this area to encourage heather um, and a small gorse back so that we could get um, silver studded blues breeding over here which is far more typical of habitat. Um, however, this time, John Henderson, um, the uh, cameraman here uh, and reporter for BBC Spotlight, still, um, he was photographing us, spent a whole day with us very patiently, um, doing lots of retakes um, to make a film for BBC's Breathing Faces, Spaces campaign. Um, while I'm on this television theme, I'm going to digress. We also had a Adrian Campbell from BBC Spotlight, who's their environmental uh, reporter. Uh, he came along to interview Steve Hussey, uh, who was making a an appeal uh, for people to donate to try and buy the reserve. And it was very successful because we did, of course, buy the reserve. That area that we were clearing there looks like this today. And as you can see, we sort of succeeded in getting the heather back. Um, and the success was sort of mixed feeling success. We no longer have recorded silver study blues in the meadow. And they've reverted to using the, um, the heather here in the northeast. And while we were on the blues, this is the female common blue against the female silver studded blue. Um, they're not scale size. Uh, as you can see, the common blue has a much brighter set of lunules on the front wing and its spots on the hind wing are much more obvious than the silver studded blue. Back into the meadow, and we're going on into sort of August time now. Um, the meadow suddenly turns from yellow and starts going pink. Um, this is Centauri, uh, a member of the Gentian family. And 
while we're at the word centauri, this is centauria, this is the black knapweed, which uh, we have quite good uh, crop meadow, which attracts lots of butterflies and moths to feed. Um, the black knapweed is an unusual uh, form of the black knapweed because if you look in a book, you'll see black knapweed doesn't have those radial um, feathery edges to it, making it look um, quite sort of uh, fairy and uh, feathery and loose. Um, this is a, a local variety uh, called radiata, and it's a variety that's localized to the southwest of England. If you look at black knapweed anywhere else in the country, it doesn't have those uh, radiating um, feathery petals. Anyway, the, the, this fascinates me. The, um, the uh, word centauri on the left and centauria, centauria on the right is um, said to be from Hippocrates, who is said to have used it as a medicine for centaurs, hence the commonality of the name. As a matter of interest, if any of you do have centaurs, please don't our stuff because four butterflies. Uh, late in the year, we get migrants. Uh, we were wandering around, and for once, I didn't have a camera. And this uh, cloudy jello popped in uh, with two friends and spent um, probably two days maybe up to a week on the reserve uh, and I managed to snap it with my, cat, uh, with my phone. We also get uh, painted ladies, long distance migrants. This is the underside that we don't often see, very pretty underside. Uh, it actually migrates something like um, 9,000 miles, which is way in excess of the American uh, monarch butterfly. So don't let them tell you this, it's always bigger and better than ours. Um, it does it in a series of hops, so it will start migrating, stop, breed, the next brood migrates further, all the way up to the north, the far north. And then it migrates back in one big fell swoop, but we don't see it going back because it flies at maybe a thousand feet, or is it meters? Meters. Uh, another view of the meadow because we tended to ignore birds. We do get stone chats in the meadow, uh, quite often sitting on that pile of um, bramble and uh, scrub there. Um, but our resident um, missile thrushes can almost always be seen um, hopping around the meadow feeding, accompanied sometimes by song thrushes. The reserve's pretty good for song thrushes, actually. Um, it's got uh, space for four pairs, and we quite often have four pairs, although last year it was only two. And our resident green woodpeckers frequent the meadow. Um, they go all over the reserve um, because they've got quite a large um, territory. And I've been told that the male and the female sort of go have the, hold their own territories and then get together in one place when they breed. I don't know how true that is. Right, moving out of the meadow now into the copse. Uh, we don't have many bluebells on the site. There are some in the copse, um, but what we do have is a lovely flush of bugle, uh, which is our sort of um, blue flush of spring. This is a close up of the bugle, which is yet another mint family plant which is rather nice. We also get this in the copse. Um, this is Lady Smock. It's an unusual double flower form called Plenum. <coughs> um, and uh, of course, this would be the food plant plant for the relatively few orange tip butterflies. Uh, we also have red dead nettle and that's the celandine in the copse. Moving right down to the bottom of the copse, there's a broken down gate, bad management, you know. Um, but if you look at the post from the path on the left there, it's cracked open, it's rotted right through. 
But this was quite fortuitous one year when this little fellow bred in it. Uh, tree creeper, uh, European tree, uh, common European tree creeper. Um, and it was quite successful. We have tree creepers nesting in this area every year. And sometimes we have two pairs on the reserve, the other pair up at the uh, reservoir end. We also get flocks of siskin, um, mainly in the autumn and winter, and they can be quite large. We've had flocks of up to 10, I think, at times, uh, which is pretty good for us. And we do have, uh, and we record very frequently, a pair of bullfinches, but we've never managed to prove that they've bred on the reserve, but they're almost always hanging around. Just uh, opposite the gate and down towards the main reserve again, there's another pond. Um, well, I call it a pond. Um, we, don't, we don't really have a name for it. Sometimes it's called the North Pond or um, uh, the Top Pond but it's unusual because it acts more like a mirror. It can be full of water, as you can see in this picture, so you can cover the roots of that tree, or it can be empty, but the status of its um, amount of water bears very little rela relationship to the amount of rain. We can have tons of rain and this place is almost dry and vice versa, um, as it was this year. Uh, not much rain at this time, and yet it was full. Anyway, apart from being a pretty little glade, it's basically um, marsh tits. Uh, marsh tits uh, nest in the bottom around here. And if you're really lucky, firecrest. Uh, we've had firecrest recorded on several years in the past. But in the last two years, they've been calling and singing um, for two to three weeks, sometimes probably more, along the path from Wrights Lane right down to here. Um, we, again, haven't proved breeding, but for singing for such a long time, it looks promising, rather nice. And it's also a good place to find our uh, resident spot uh, resident migrant spotted flycatchers. Uh, we almost always have a family of spotted flycatchers on the reserve, um, but they can be quite elusive. Uh, but the, uh, this, this northern pond is a very good place to see them. And many of the reports are from there. There was a dead uh, silver birch next to the ball. As you can see, it had a hole in it. Um, which housed the nest of a great spotted woodpecker. Now, if any of you have had teenagers and gone into their punk phase, this is the punk phase of a great spotted woodpecker. Here's dad, uh, who's been busy trying to feed them. Uh, another tree hole nesting species, the nuthatch. Um, we have two pairs of great spotted woodpeckers normally and two pairs of nuthatches. Um, which is nice, uh, and I love both of them. Both, and they're both very noisy throughout the whole season, year, the whole of the year, which makes it rather nice when you're trying to count them, because I do all of my counting by sound. We have in the meadow and in the copse very large numbers of um, dog violet. And many of you will know that dog violet is the food plant of many of our fritillaries. And we have uh, dark green fritillaries and small pearl border fritillaries and silver wash fritillaries. And all of these can be found on the reserve, usually in the meadow, uh, on the edges of the meadow uh, or in the copse. And in the copse, um, they're quite easy to see uh, sometimes because they, we've got a buddlier plant that they gather on, which I'll show you later. A uh, lot of uh, honeysuckle all over the reserve. And we were privileged in that the DWT was asked to collect the seeds for honeysuckle to 
put into the Millennium Seed Bank that Kew Gardens was um, forming uh, or has formed uh, at Wakehurst Place in uh, Sussex. Um, and just while we're on that, uh, the holly berries from Bystock uh, form their holly collection as well. Oh, quite quite a, uh, a nice boost for our morale. Um, while we're on this, the up going up that path right at the other end, that dark green blob to the right of the oak tree, is the Budlia bush of which I spoke. This is a good place to find the, um, uh, the butterflies in summer. Um, the honeysuckle then was the food plant for this. This is the white admiral. Um, last year and the year before were very good years for white admirals. Uh, not only did we have a few in the cops, but they were um, breeding in the um, woodland alongside the eastern side of the meadow. So if you walk down that side of the meadow, um, you had a very good chance of finding these flitting around in the little open areas and glades in the woodland. And as a comparison, here's the uh, familiar Red Admiral. Um, I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say that we were looking for this butterfly. This is the purple hair streak. We thought we wouldn't get purple hair streaks because we only had uh, turkey oaks. But when we went to uh, see some friends in Essex, we went to a reserve there and met a chap who was a butterfly expert, said, oh, no, 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 don't worry about that. Um, very good, you can find, find them on turkey oaks just as well as you can find them on English oaks. So Liz and I took some chairs into the meadow, into the copse. We set them down in front of the best vista to get the um, views that we could of the tops of the trees. And about an hour and a half later, after we woke up, having fallen asleep, uh, we hadn't seen any and then it was getting too late anyway. But a couple of years later, Liz found uh, the familiar silvery flittering in the tops of the trees and then managed to find me one of these. Uh, this was actually taken from within the meadow. Um, but it's not a very good picture, but it was the best I could do. Again, uh, ferns. This is a golden scaled male fern. Uh, we have both, both this one and the common male fern on the reserve. Almost impossible to tell apart um, easily, uh, but during the bio blitz, we were told uh, that the chap who was the expert uh, said that it was very unusual, but we had many, many more of these than we had on the, than we had the common male fern on buy stock, which is totally the reserve, the reverse of most um, reserves. Strawberry, common strawberry, and the fruit, rather pretty. Not very many. That is quite a colour. And rosemary, willow herb. Um, I've added this in because it's the food plant for, oh dear, sorry, the food plant for the elephant hawk moth. And we do get um, elephant hawk moth on the reserve amongst uh, many other uh, species. This is a uh, gatekeeper. Um, you can find gatekeepers in the copse and in the meadow. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with um, the brown butterflies like this, if they've got the wings closed, they can look very similar to, um, to the meadow brown. But if you look on these black spots on the wings, this one has two white spots and a meadow brown only has one white spot. Just to get ringlets. Uh, I love ringlets, they've got character, they're fairly sort of dull velvety brown on the top with a white band around the edge of the wing, but these beautiful spots underneath, I think they give it a lot of character. And of course the speckled wood, well many of us probably have speckled wood in the garden, uh, they're quite a ubiquitous butterfly, but uh, uh, this well marked individual I found again on buy stock. Uh, and you can see them flying throughout the season. Um, going back into the, uh, the cops, 
we can find three of our common garden butterflies, the peacock, the small tortoiseshell, and the common. Now, we don't have nettles because most of our ground is too poor for them. But where we've cut the meadow in the past, uh, quite a long time ago, the cuttings were dumped in the corner of the meadow and a whole host of nettles have grown up and we've left them there uh, as a food plant for our uh, common garden. Another view of the cops uh, showing a rather nice uh, spring vista and we have a large, quite a large number of nest boxes for this little fellow, the dormouse. Um, we've had um, Jan's been counting dormouse for some while and uh, has had pretty good results. They're not large numbers, but we do have reports almost all years, which is nice. Uh, wetland plants in the meadow again. Uh, this is uh, water mint, and that's a large skipper feeding on the water mint. And tutsi. Uh, it's our largest hypericum. We do have uh, um, slender um, St. John's wort and uh, one or two other hypericums. And exocets. Uh, this is an exocet blue tit um, coming out of one of our boxes. And nest boxes house. Uh, great tits as well as the marsh tits we saw earlier. We have uh, at least one family, if not two, of long tail tits that forage over the reserve. We've never found the nest. And the blue tit, of course, that um, we have lots of uh, nesting in the nest. Later in the year, one of my favorite wildflowers is this common like it. I suppose it reminds me of when I was a child and my parents grew antirhinums in the garden and this is the closest that comes to a wild antirhinum uh, that I know of. Later in the year uh, is fungus time and we get parasols which uh, we have eaten. One of our reserves officers once found a very large number of them growing and said, I'll have those for my lunch. And we said, can we share some please? And she gave them to us and they're sort of size of small dinner plates. By the time they fried them up, <laughs> they were about the size of a large ordinary field mushroom, but they were delicious, but we wouldn't dare touch. We don't have the confidence to touch. Um, these are earth falls. Um, these found in, a, in the same area. And both of these grow on um, old grass cuttings, surprisingly, uh, but this time is in the cops. Right, moving to the uh, somewhat uh, dead wildlife wise, um, pine wood, or is it? Um, it was fairly dead, but we cut tons of holes out of it and created um, clearings, and the clearings have encouraged some of our birds to nest in the middle. Uh, this is a tit, and one of the other birds in chaffinches. We've had more chaffinches in the cleared areas than we used to. And in fact, um, one of the cleared areas, the year after it was cleared, um, it attracted a, a pair of song thrushes. So very successful. Uh, this is tiger's eyes fungus. Uh, grows on old fire uh, areas. So uh, the area under this was the site of a fire, um, but a very pretty fungus, I think. And green elf cap, cup, um, a fungus whose mycelium gets into the wood and it stains it blue like this. And the um, artisans uh, that make Umbrageware, of which this is an example, collect the stained wood, usually oak, and they cut it into small wooden blocks. If you're not familiar with Umbrageware, 
and they lay the wooden blocks out end on um, to form these patterns, these beautiful patterns. Um, the blue box fungus it's, provides the blue colour and then they um, level it all off and polish it up and you have these beautiful patterns made out of just the colour. Blue being blue box fungus. Rockwood. Um, <laughs> we named it Rockwood because we found an old um, badger set, uh, disused badger set in it. Um, but we haven't proved, we, we put sand in front of it for paw prints. We got one paw print one year and haven't proved anything since. Um, but uh, anyway, nevertheless, called Rockwood, it's predominantly beach and provides us with some beautiful autumn colours and spring colours and some rather statuesque trees. These beech trees have on them porcelain fungus. This porcelain fungus, um, I can't remember the actual scientific name, but it is rather dangerous and causes the tree eventually to drop its branches. Um, and uh, if you look at it carefully, you can see it's absolutely polished, shiny, like a piece of porcelain, and it's pure white. And beech trees also house the uh, um, beech bracken fungus, um, which is quite nice. So beech trees aren't all that bad, but they do have such a dense canopy that they don't produce much of an understory. So we are slowly cutting the um, um, holly from underneath to produce a bit more open space, taking a lot of work, but we've done some quite good bits. Another view of the um, beach on the border. And uh, we get turkey tails. And this is candle snuff. Very pretty. I love this. So these are all the easy to identify ones. And uh, this one's penny bun or set. Uh, surprised it stays there because it's edible and apparently highly prized. Going back into the valley now, um, the valley, as I said, was wet heath surrounded by dry heath. Just of interest, that tree there is a mature down, downy birch, um, Betula, uh, Betula pubicens. You can tell it's not a silver birch because although it has all the normal characteristic silver bark, but if you look at the growing branches, uh, the ends of the branches, twigs, these are all fairly erect, but on a betula pendula, the silver birch, they all dangle down. So they sort of have a drooping effect. So even from a distance, you can tell the difference. Anyway, Liz was lucky enough to spot this one here while she had my camera, a bit of a, Cheek, I thought she did very well to, to catch this rather scruffy deer, um, which uh, was nice because it's the only visual record we've got of deer. We have seen them on quite a few occasions, um, but uh, never managed to get this close before. Um, so, uh, beautiful one. Uh, the holly, this is the one we sent off to Q. And holly, of course, is the food plant for the caterpillar of the holly blue, um, which uh, many of you will be familiar with in your garden. Um, holly blue normally has two broods. And believe it or not, and surprisingly, the second brood is on ivy, which is a rather nice connection with holly that isn't connected with Christmas cards and um, songs at Christmas. This is a valley picture in um, spring. Um, we have a very large population now because we haven't been cutting any of it during the management work parties of um, older buckthorn. The bush, the light green bush in the bottom right hand side of the picture is older buckthorn. Now, older buckthorn is very useful if you like blowing things up because if you make charcoal out of it, the charcoal is one of the smoothest and most even burning of all the charcoal. It's extremely good for making fuses um, to set fire to gunpowder and the like. Um, because it's even burning, you can more or less guarantee the time that the fuse takes to burn. 
so you get so we're all right if we have a uh, another a war we've got our own gunpowder anyway getting on to the actual plant these are the uh, berries that come off in later year they turn black when they're fully ripe and this is the egg of this caterpillar the little green sausage shaped thing in the middle of the leaf of as many of you have already guessed the brimstone butterfly uh, brimstones are very common on the reserve uh, and this must be because we have so much of this <laughs> uh, order buckthorn um, if you you know if you've made the mistake and cut it down because instantly instantly the um, sap turns bright orange a brilliant orange color so then you know which is the one you shouldn't cut down in future this Melinia, Melinia. This is purple moor grass, Melinia perulia. Um, this is what the ponies are here to keep down because we don't want it to take over everything. Uh, and they take, of course, all the other stuff as well. Um, every so often, if you're lucky and keep your eyes open, you can find this fungus. This is ergot. Um, some of you may be familiar with ergot. Ergot was a fungus which was the curse of the people in the Middle Ages before they discovered it. Um, it contaminated wheat, if used in bread, would cause a disease called St Anthony's fire, which was a horrific disease that caused immense burning feeling in all your joints, and you sort of went mad and started dancing around. Um, technical name, I think, ergotism. Not for me. Good place to see dragonflies again because we're in the damp valley. Um, some of the earliest uh, colonizers are the broad bodied chaser. Um, the male is on the right with its pretty powder blue colour, and the female, the lovely golden yellow one on the left. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but my own dragonflies quite often have this colour. <coughs> Excuse me. Picture of our boardwalk next door to the long ponds or the small ponds, whatever you like to call them, um, which is a, another good place for dragonflies. Um, and here we have two confusion species. Well, they're not very confusing. Both of these fly around this area. The large red will also fly around the um, uh, reservoir. The large red is on the left. And I've tried to make these two scale relative to each other, uh, though they are both very small, less than an inch in the case of the small red damsel. Um, small red damsel fly on the right, and the way you remember it is small red is all red. So it's got red legs, red eyes, red abdomen, uh, no black bits on it, and red uh, wing spots or pterostigma, little red spots at the end of the wings can be used to identify many of the dragonflies and damselflies, uh, the breed divinity. Um, the large red damselfly on the left has got black legs and it's got black markings on the abdomen, so it's very easily distinguished. Um, you cannot use size. The small red damselfly is nationally important. So we've got a nationally important um, population here they're not hard to see. If you go onto the ball walk that runs across by the, uh, the long ponds, um, you only have to linger for a short while. If you've got good eyes, these things hover around quite slowly and then they'll perch and they'll stay there quite um, uh, tamely and don't, don't really move. They're quite easy to photograph. Another view of the long ponds. And um, they've got a good... Uh, selection of flowers on them. This is bog asphodel, uh, a, a lily uh, family plant. Close up of the flowers, beautiful star shaped flowers, and it produces quite a carpet of yellow at the right time. Uh, but the, uh, the plant that all the children love is the sundew. This is round leaf sundew, an insectivorous plant. Uh, not enough uh, nutrients to keep this plant happy in the earth so it catches its own flies it throws out these little uh, spiky hair like um, protrusions from the leaf 
uh, and each of those has a sticky substance on the uh, end of it and the insect comes in, gets stuck, can't move, uh, the leaf rolls up and just ingests it. Lovely. Uh, a general view across the valley uh, from uh, one side, looking down on the long ponds and the boardwalk. That boardwalk is a very good place to spot common lizards. If you go there either early in the morning or if it's a quiet day and not many people and just wander along the boardwalk, you're almost certainly likely to see common lizards basking on it. And close by, you could be lucky enough to find um, slow worms. Uh, slow worms can be found anywhere on the reserve. Come to that and so can common lizards. The boardwalk is a hot spot for them. So those reptiles. And our dragonflies, this is um, the uh, keeled skimmer. And as you can see, similar colouring to the broad bodied chaser with the powder blue male on the left in this instance and the golden yellow female on the right. Um, these are fairly restricted distribution dragonflies. So we're lucky to have them on the reserve. And the four spotted chaser. Uh, this dragonfly can be seen here and on the reservoir. Uh, they're very easily seen on the reservoir because they perch on the vegetation right on the boardwalk. So uh, um, that's where this photograph In the bottom of the valley, at the right time of year, which is um, sort of mid-year, um, you can see this phenomenon. This, uh, this is when the valley dried out a bit. And although you can't actually see any detail, this is actually a flush of dog pimpernel, uh, which is a very, very pretty flower. Here's a close-up. Uh, and it grows in great profusion some years, but it's always present. Um, it carpets the bottom, but on the side of the um, on the side of the uh, grass tussocks, you can find uh, <laughs> lesser skull I've got a I've got a blank spot for lesser skull I don't know why. I just keep on faltering over the name. <laughs> so my prompt uh, uh, was here helping me with that one. And marsh violet. Moving on, if you look in the bottom of the uh, very dry parts, you might find this one. This is um, pale butterwort, our other insectivorous plant. It's got sticky um, veins on the leaves, catches insects, and uh, devours them uh, to close up with the flower. Uh, this stream runs through the whole of the middle of the reserve and because it's fast flowing, it attracts uh, beautiful demoiselle damselflies. Male on the left, female on the right. And it's a good place to see our other large um, dragonfly. This one uh, vies for the emperor with size. This is a golden ring dragonfly, uh, but it is slightly longer, but may not be quite as bold. Um, going on into the, uh, back to the bird life, uh, we get a pair of um, yellow hammers and you can often see stone chat in the valley. We have snipe uh, drumming uh, for uh, three years, I think it is now. Um, we had our attention drawn to the snipe by a friend of ours, Sarah uh, Butcher, who uh, was doing a talk or was it a talk? Night a night jar hunt and heard, heard them drumming and uh, we went along and sure enough um, we think because they drum for so long um, that they probably certainly had a territory uh, but whether they bred or not I don't know. This is the only photograph that we didn't take ourselves. Um, had to borrow one of these, never got near enough to a night jar. We always have a pair of night jars that hunt over the reserve. And if you stand at the bottom of the uh, meadow, it's probably the best place to see and hear them. Our other two reptiles uh, that are 
uh, quite common on the reserve. That was a grass snake, and this is um, the adder. Uh, both of them are fairly frequently seen by people, but not always counted. Hard to see. Um, this is a close up of the skin of a dead adder. It's rather pretty, it's a male. And Dartford Warbler. Uh, for the first few years that Liz and I counted, these actually nested on the reserve. But as the habitat started to disappear, they moved away. They're seen annually passing through. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that one day they may actually um, breed again. So, so what does this all add up to? Well, uh, we're going to bats. Uh, Sarah has uh, recorded the bats for us over the years and have recorded 13 species of bat that forage over the reserve. Pretty good considering there's only probably 17 or 18 in the country on average. Uh, excellent result. Butterflies, 32 species of butterflies and more than 100 moths. Um, we get 29 species of butterflies regularly. Uh, dragonflies and damselflies, 22 species of dragonflies and damselflies, pretty good count as well. Uh, it was added to last year when our daughter and son-in-law found the first red vein data for the, um, for the reserve and they were breeding last year on Black Hill Quad. And the plants, we've got more than 112 species of plants, higher plants and eight ferns. And birds, 74 species of birds, and 34 species have bred. And I couldn't find a decent sunset, so um, this is the best I could do. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Right. right. Roger, Roger, thank you so much. That was amazing talk and the most beautiful photographs. It's incredible how many species there are on such a small, fairly comparatively small reserve. It's amazing. And brilliant, brilliant photographs. I haven't seen, I haven't realised how much, how diverse the wildlife was there. So thank you. No, thank you. Um, uh, I've had a couple of, a few questions. Yeah. One, can I ask you a few, just, just to... You can ask me as many. I'm, I'm here until I go to bed. Um, Finish up. <laughs> so, long as, so long as there's time for a beer afterwards, I don't mind. Uh, Mr Thorne asked about red starts. Have you seen any red starts? No, uh, not, not common Wither red starts. We have one passed through on Wethick and Raleigh, which was just across the way. But uh, no, we don't get red starts. We don't have the on habitat passage. for them. Um, yeah, it's on passage across the way, but we don't have them on our reserve and we've not seen them. Okay. Um, a lady called Cathy said she'd only visited the reserve once and seen, seen something called a rhombic leather bug. Have you heard of that? No, oh, I'm from the, the, the bugs and flies and so on, we have to leave to others. Oh, okay. <laughs> My brain's too, too muddled with trying to remember the, the butterflies, dragonflies, birds and flowers that we know. I'm okay. well, sorry, going back to the birds quickly. Uh, we haven't had red start, but we did have a passage um, wood warbler about oh, years ago, which was quite good. Excellent. It was great to see by stock in all the seasons and all the a, a variety of flowers as well. Um, and interesting snippets about the green elf cup being used for dye and the older buckthorn for fuses. It's yes. amazing. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, yeah, we're all right if we have a, a riot or something, we can just make our own gunpowder. Um, uh, somebody called Mr. or Mrs. Bale asked, what were the two types of orchid? Oh, um, we only have one orchid uh, on the show, which was common spotted. The reserve, we, over the years, we've recorded uh, one southern marsh orchid, two early purple orchids, 
and until last year we had a broad green, uh, broad leaved hellebarine, but they're all uh, transient. Um, usually the individual ones get eaten by rabbits. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, a gentleman asked um, by email before the talk, and I don't know if he's here, Mr. Dick Andrews, about the fish in the ponds. And you did reply to me, but I thought you might like to just... Um, yeah, well, we've, we've contacted Ed Copkinson, who's the reserves officer, but there are no real records. Um, the only records of uh, fish are for uh, three-spined stickleback and koi carp. Um, I have photographed um, a shoal of fish, small shoal of fish, which, um, although not a good photograph, would indicate that that shoal of fish was rud. Although we've had somebody um, contacting us thinking it was roach, but I'm prepared to be persuaded either way, but the central fin is midway between the lower two fins. So that sort of tends to indicate rud, but it's open to conjecture. The koi carp, we don't know, because they were big ones, they were probably worth 500 to 1,000 pounds each. So why, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but we've got a feeling they could have disappeared for two reasons. One is because somebody's fished them out and uh, is enjoying them. Or the other one is that uh, uh, <laughs> we've had people actually filming an otter. And could be that an otter had a rather extensive meal. Yeah, called on blur stuff, isn't it, really? <laughs> it would be. Um, Sally Rogers wanted a species list. So thank you, Sarah, for uh, providing that. There was, a, on the chat, there's an email link, isn't there, about species um, list? I don't know. Our, our local group website has a species list on it uh, for the higher species. Um, and also a pamphlet uh, which shows you the sort of highlight species, where to find them and a little bit of information and what time to find them at. Oh yeah, I've got that. Download that. Yeah. If anyone wants that uh, email address, um, we can either, uh, oh sorry, web address, I can either tell you now if you've got pens and pencils or I can, um, ask you to email us uh, and we can give you the link. Uh, so it's entirely up to you how you get it, but it's on a website and you can download it, both the, um, the species list and uh, the uh, guide, the, the wildlife guide. So, um, be done. Someone's asked about amphibians in the pond and Georgina said, she had memories of her dad taking her to see the terrapins. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ready terrapins. The terrapins are a complete menace, unfortunately, and should never have been put in there. Um, our reserves officer built a humane trap, and amazingly, uh, last year, uh, year before last, managed to capture them all all seven of them, <gasps> and to a reserve, uh, to a place that looks after them. So they weren't used as hamburgers for whatever. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, some rotten person's going to put another one in there. Uh, so there is, we think, still one in there. Um, it's a great shame because uh, we're lucky enough to have this profusion of dragonflies, and they eat the dragonflies. And when you consider that we've got all those species, we don't really want to lose, especially our, our downy emeralds and um, the hairies uh, because they're uh, locally important. Um, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, there is probably still one there, but Amph it can go. <laughs> yeah. Amphibians in the pond? Uh, we've got common toad and common frog and which newt? Smooth new, I think. Sarah. Smooth new. Sarah, Sarah's about somewhere. Uh, she might be able to remember I that one. I think it's smooth new too. Thank you, Roger. John and Valerie asked, are, are they good at, is there good access through footpaths and um, access? Um, they, yeah. um, there yeah. are 
the, there are paths, they're unmarked, but there are paths throughout the reserve. You can actually wander anywhere, but it's best to stay to the paths because it can get either very boggy or um, extremely thorny uh, if you try and stray off them. Um, but um, the paths are vaguely marked on our map, which is the species map, and there's a pamphlet which I think you can download, I'm not sure, from Devon Wildlife Trust, uh, their path marks some paths. But basically uh, there are only, well there's only really one entrance that's properly accessible because um, we had to close the north entrance where we had a small car park because a neighbour um, claimed that he owned the land between our car park and the road and took a court injunction to stop us using it. So you have to park at the south entrance and um, all the paths emanate from there anyway. And they're fairly obvious paths. You just wander around and you'll eventually come back to where you started. Sorry, I can't give you any better than that. But no, that's fine. Are... Maurice asks how long we, the Devon Wildlife Trust has had the reserve. Since 1976. And you, it was... Um, yeah, been managing it since then. Um, but we didn't own it until 2016 when we were forced to buy it because Southwest Lakes Trust was forced to sell it to make money for Southwest Water. So, but we do own it now and it's fully protected now. Um, thank you. David asks, would it not be ideal to introduce various species of amphibian, newts in particular in trouble? Do we ever introduce species? It's wise not to introduce anything, um, with a, apart from anything else. Um, they may eat the uh, natural, uh, mm. they might be the dragonflies again in our case. We don't want uh, species that shouldn't be there to be there. And you would have to go jump through hoops to introduce another species there with natural England, and they would probably refuse. Um, there are licenses to introduce um, insects on some reserves, uh, notably the small, uh, sorry, the southern damselfly, which was reintroduced to Ben Ottery Common, um, but it was a historic site and there were good records of it having been there and it's the perfect habitat. And they're doing well as it happens. And they were introduced from Hampshire. Yay. Thank you. Um, I think I've forgotten what the other question was, but um, maybe we've had enough anyway. But thank you ever so much for everyone. Oh, Brenda's put a link to a website to download the pamphlet and the species list. So that'll be in the chat room. Oh, will it? In the chat facility. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well done. Yeah.